So he thought he could get something out of Balaam. Verse 7 says, And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with rewards of divination. The rewards of divination was just money, different things. The pagans were very fond of giving uh, uh, monetary rewards to soothsayers and, 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 and enchanters and magicians and what such, and they considered Balaam in that category. So what did Balak do? He sent reward in hands of the ones to confront Balaam about this. Now Balaam, this evil prophet, he waits about. He is a man straddling the fence. He is a man that has an opportunity to do the perfect will of God. But he also is confronted with a great temptation in his life. And that is to follow the permissive will. The will that God will allow because choice is necessary under the reign of the sovereign God Jehovah in which we serve. And you and I both come to these crossroads every day in our life. God's perfect will, God's permissive will. Balaam is going to be confronted with God's perfect will, God's permissive will. Let's see what happens now as we pick up in verse 8. And he said unto them, now let me back up a second. Remember in verse 7, Abalek sends him. Uh, it says right here, and the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination. That is to give to Balaam in exchange for what he could do for Balak. And they come into Balaam and he spake unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, lodge here this night. Now remember... What they did was they made that proposition that Balak, come and do this, we understand, you, can, you have the power within you, and we are requesting your services. Now here's where it gets interesting in verse 8, and he said unto them, lodge here this night, and I'll bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. In other words, he had absolute faith that God could give him an answer, but he had a great pulling in his life to do the wrong thing. You ever feel that way? Go on now. You ever feel that way that God has already given you the, the direction you know the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit to follow and do the right thing? And when you're saved, you just have an unction in your life to do the things that are pleasing to God and ultimately in the best interest of those around you. We've been studying that in 1 John Bible study about one of the greatest hallmarks of a believer is loving your brethren, doing the things that please God, doing the things that are right, and the more we drift over into the gray areas of straddling the fence, as we call it, the less joy we have in the Lord, the more confusion that comes out of it. Balaam must have been a man of great crosswinds of things in his life. And it said in verse 8, he told them to abide there. In verse 9, it says, And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, now this is a rhetorical question. That's, that's when you ask a question knowing the answer for an illustrative purpose. God asked Balaam a very rhetorical question. And God came to Balaam and said unto him, What men are these with thee? One, he wanted to see Balaam's answer. <laughs> God puts us in circumstances sometimes to see what our answer is going to be. And he knows the answer. God knows everything. In verse 10, it says that Balaam said unto God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me then. Her adventure I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. Now that's not Balaam speaking of himself. That is Balaam reiterating to God the message that Balak had asked him to do. Now let's see what God's opinion of this question is. Verse 12, And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. And Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your own land, for the Lord refuseth to give me leave to go with you. Here we see Balaam was faithful to God at this particular time. Here we see that for a moment in time, Balaam would do the right thing. How many times in our life we come to a decision and we do the right thing? In the midst of temptation, in the midst of knowing that God's perfect will and our person, His permissive will for our life, we stand at the crossroads. 
For a moment in time, Balaam could have done the right thing. And oftentimes in our life, for a moment in time, we can do the right thing. But here's the situation. Which one do we do? Which one does Balaam do? Well, he sends them back. Ah, oh, but look at verse 15. We're going to see the persistence of the adversary. I want you to understand that there is a time in our life such as when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. That he was tempted, it says, of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. It doesn't say those three, but that was pretty much the things that Jesus was tempted with in the wilderness. And then it said at the following that, that the devil was made to depart for a season. But make no mistake about it, he will return. How do I know that? The life of Christ chronicles how the adversary would come at him. We see so many times throughout the life of the apostles and disciples in general, people in the Bible, that the devil is a relentless foe. He will never leave you alone. And the worst thing you can do is underestimate how the devil can stumble you in the perfect will of God. There is a permissive will, and that is not necessarily of the evil of, of Satan, but the permissive will can very well facilitate the evil in our life. The permissive will is the very product of a sovereign God. It's called choice. It's called giving us the ability to choose and love God because love that is forced is not love. A love that is chosen is love. We used to say the old proverb you hear that's not in the Bible, but a lot of truth. If you love something, set it free. If it comes back to you, it's yours. If it doesn't, it never was. And one day, God, although we all belong to God in some facet, one day, He gives us a choice now and one day, one day, many will not come back to Him. And He will say, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. See, they chose a permissive will. Permissive means that God gave us permission to choose. And if we so choose to walk away from God, God will love you the same. I want you to know that there are sinners in hell today that God loved them all the way to the gates. Maybe He loves them to this day in a position that they will never ever be reunited back to Him. And maybe it breaks His heart. I don't know how the dynamics of God's compassion works after the death of an individual. But I do know one thing right now in the time that we're in control of our soul, God will love the sinner all the way down that long winding road of that permissive wheel that takes him away from God and into the direction of of an eternal hell and eternal separation from God. And that permissive will is something that we face every day in our life. We must choose. Balaam was at the crossroads and Balaam could have done the right thing. I'm not taken up for Balaam as a character in the Word of God, but many people write Balaam off as a mere soothsayer. But we see a faith in Jehovah. We see a faith that God would answer and give him the direction and that some chance he would do the right thing. But in essence, we don't see that. I can even fast forward and we can see that his betrayal of Israel later would ultimately lead many people astray because where we're seeing now is just the beginning of Balaam completely getting out of the will of God and taking that permissive will in a way that would be greatly sinful it would be very destructive, and I believe it's the 31st chapter in Genesis. You will see that he is run through with the sword. It ultimately leads to his death and demise. Do you think that he could have kept on going had he been in God's perfect will, in the care of God like so many great individuals in the Old Testament and knew where God put his providential hand and protection upon him like we studied in Sunday school with the apostles? You better know God could have took care of him. But when we lance out in a direction of free agency, away from God in that permissive avenue away from the perfect will of God that completely leads you better know and you better be ready to take the cup that you are seeking to drink from. Balaam would do just that. Let's see what happens. Well here in a moment he's going to get so spiritually blind caught up in greed, caught up in self-pursuit that his, his own donkey is going to have to see for him. I think there's a little insult to injury in this story. God has a sense of humor. Look at each of us in the mirror and you'll see that God has a sense of humor. But one thing about it, he also will allow us to make a fool of ourselves if we are so adamant to walk independently of his divine knowledge for our lives. Let's read on. All right, so we see here now, we're picking up at verse 15. 
And Balak sent yet again. Now here's that persistence before I went off there for a moment or two. Here there is a great persistence in our adversary. Balak is working in behalf of the adversary. He is working against the Israelites. Look at this now. Mm -mm -mm. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. And Balaam answered. Now Balaam could have at that point in time said, Look, fella, I told you the last time. Remember what we studied a while back about the attributes of Job? Let me remind you, the Bible said Job was the greatest of men in the East. That's a lot of competition when the East goes all the way into India and ancient Persia. Some of the great individuals that came out of there in determination and even godly view. Hey man, Job was a man that eschewed evil. He shut down and turned away from everything that came his way. Boy, could Balaam have learned from that story. Could Balaam have just shut down right there and said, Look, guys, I told you a little while ago. I listened to God. I told you and sent you on your way. And now you're back. Turn around and go back to where you came from. But look at this. We see a little bit of ourselves in this. What's he doing? What am I saying? He begins to entertain the thought. Uh, how many times we entertain the thought of something going down an avenue of thought, of action, motive that we shouldn't go? Look at this now. Balak prophes up. He gives him a second proposition. He tells him he'll promote him to a great status. Anything that Balaam wants, Balak said, you will get, my friend. But he says, now therefore in verse 19, now listen, let me back up a second. Verse 18 said, and Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Now that sounds good enough, don't it? What are you talking about, Scott? You said a moment ago he should have turned away. It sounds like he is. Well, let's read on and let's see. Listen to this now, verse 19. Now therefore I pray you, tarry ye also here this night, that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. <laughs> oh, how many times have we toy with God in that fashion, wanting to hear what we want to hear, wanting to receive the news that we want to receive. How many times has God given you an opportunity in life? Or let me put it this way, an opportunity arises, it's really not of God. So you put it on the back burner and begin to pray, not to hear from God, but to hear from God what you want to hear from God. I've done it, you've done it, and we'll continue to do it. He said, and God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, if the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shall thou do. Now listen to this. I want you to notice in verse 21 something that I think is noteworthy here. Now, what we're arriving at here is this permissive will coming to a great reality. Balaam already had the direction, first will of God to start with. He already did. <clears throat> then through further efforts of Balak, listen now, notice, Balaam secures a permissive will of God. <laughs> he is literally standing at the crossroads. His car is idling and he's revving it up. God begins to test him further. He said, okay, I'll tell you what, Balaam. If they come looking for you, you do this, you do that. Balaam didn't. He just disregarded all that. He just gets up in the morning and boom, I'm gone. That's all I needed to hear. How many times do we take a little bit of the truth and run with it blindly and think, well, I got what I wanted. How many times do you pray seeking God's will or your own will, which is securing God's permissive will, which in essence is not the right avenue? Now, I don't want to confuse anybody, but I believe we all know what I'm talking about. 
This story can get confusing to some people, but it's real simple. It's a story of obedience. It's a story of tests. Listen, God will try you in the areas of your life where there are imperfections that need worked out. He does not try you that awful much in areas that you seem to got a handle on. Apostle Paul, for example, said, I prayed three times for God to remove this whatever in my life. But he told me, Paul, my grace is sufficient. I'll get you past it. And in the meantime, I'll continue to focus on this area in your life, of which none of us really know what it was. But it kept him praying. It kept him focused. And God was perfecting Paul. I don't know the whole relationship with Balaam and God. And some preachers and people may disagree and just write him off as a soothsayer. But soothsayers did not have communication with God Jehovah in such a way that Balaam did. And to me it's proof that Balaam had the fear of the Lord, the beginning of wisdom, because he did communicate with God Almighty and he listened to Him. There was a relation there, but he was constantly securing the permissive will of God in a wrong way. Attitude. Balaam's biggest part was an attitude creating motives that involved the securing of God's permissive will. And listen now, securing God's permissive will as opposed to accepting God's perfect will. A little bit of theology there for us in that. Let's go on now. Look at this now. So what did God say? If they come for you, go. Well, it says nothing in verse 21 indicating anything like that. <laughs> you know what this tells me, Eddie? A little truth or a little good doesn't make it all good. Because if there's just a little bit, the rest can be not good. Listen to this. Verse 21, And Balaam rose up in the morning, he saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. And God's anger was kindled because he went. So many times people say, well, I just don't understand. Why was God? You're missing the point. There was a lack of obedience in that story. Hey, God may have changed his mind on the fly and said, hey, I'll tell you what. I got a second idea. Let's do it this way. But you wait on me. It's real simple. He didn't. Don't let the devil confuse you on the scriptures. Pay real close attention to the detail on these things. Because it's just like our lives. We've got to pay real close attention to the details. If you think I'm joking, why do you think in the Old Testament the Levitical law and all of the things they had to pay such attention to detail right down to the tabernacle, right down to the Levites' practice? Why do you think that was such an attention to detail articulated to a point that seems ridiculous because it was preparing us for a life that should be articulated like that before God? He's saying, Scott, i got to be perfect. No, 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 no. We're never going to be perfect. That's why grace is there. But strive for perfection. Strive for that attention to detail in your relationship with God. And if we do, although our righteousness is as filthy rags, we will certainly please God with a tremendous articulation in our life to serve him. Balaam took it and ran, and God was angered, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way of the adversary. Look at this now. Against him. Now, keep in mind, he's on, I'm going to call it a donkey. He is on his donkey, and he is moving. Look at verse 23. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord stand in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. Now, Balaam is on his donkey, and he's riding. That was a utility vehicle then. A donkey was something that was used in the exact... So, so that was common. This was a common animal. But Balaam had done, secured God's permissive will to the point, I will add, so to the point that he was spiritually blind of God's will. You see this? You want to wonder what this story's about? It's about a man full of his own motives, secured in God's permissive will, in the wrong attitude, with his spiritual eyes turned off so badly to the point that God had to get his attention by the animal he was riding. Look at this. Good stuff here. We can learn a lot now. Listen to this.